print out my PowerPoint. So like I have your PowerPoint in front, of it, but I do it um, with the outline. So I know I will need the images to know like um, the cells and everything. I will study that. But to, to make sure that I know definitions and terms, I do an outline of your PowerPoints and just it, it'll show me like my key points. Perfect. Yes, yeah, that, that definitely works. That definitely, definitely works. Very good. OK. Um, any other questions? No, ma'am. I'll mute my microphone. OK. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go over chapter one, and then we may even have time to go over chapter two also. And what I want to do with the first part of chapter one is go over it very quickly because it's uh, I think it's a little bit easier. It's something that you can read yourself and, and, and understand. I think the second part is uh, more important and more involved. So I want to spend more time on the second part of chapter one, which will be the second PowerPoint. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, I am recording, so you need to be aware of that. And uh, uh, if it becomes too loud at your end, I might ask you to turn your microphone uh, off. Okay. Okay. So the first part of uh, chapter one gives you a little bit of history of microbiology, uh, since it is such a new science. Uh, names to know? Yeah, you do need to know uh, Van Leeuwenhoek because he was the father of microbiology, the first person that recorded and reported seeing microorganisms. Um, then this other aspect that's in this, you should definitely know also the theory of spontaneous generation versus the theory of biogenesis. Uh, you should be able to uh, explain both theories, you know, what's the theory of spontaneous generation and then explain the theory of biogenesis. Um, and um, you can read about how uh, the uh, theory of spontaneous generation was uh, refuted and defeated. And the most important of all the experiments is Pasteur's experiment. And um, definitely you should know about Louis Pasteur. And you should know the principle of the experiment that he designed, the um, uh, gooseneck flask experiment. And let me go ahead and go to the PowerPoint that explains it right here. And I don't know why these things appear in the middle of the PowerPoints. I have no idea what that is. So, um, basically, what Pasteur did is he took broth, beef broth, and which is the medium that scientists had to start using to grow bacteria. And so he took the beef broth, which was obviously not as sterile, and he boiled it. And he boiled it for a long time. And the flask that he was boiling the beef broth in was an open flask. Uh, it had a curved neck, and at the end of the neck, the flask was open. Uh, because one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, controversies was that if you are going to boil the flask you're going to boil you're going to heat the air and that's going to kill the um the, the the living force that was creating life according to the people who believed in spontaneous generation so in this case by the flask being open it allowed for fresh unheated air to go in and yet even though air was able to go in the broth remained sterile um, and that way he proved that what made the, what contaminated the broth, the organisms that appear in the broth came from mother cells in the broth. And once you kill the mother cells, there, there was no other source of life and therefore the broth remained sterile. Um, the reason why the air did not bring with it microorganisms was because the curves of the flask trapped the dust that was carrying the microorganisms. So essentially, there was filter air going in uh, into an already sterile solution. And as long as nothing else happened, the solution would remain sterile. So with that, he proved that you needed microorganisms to make more microorganisms. Once you kill the parent microorganisms, there was no way to get any more microorganisms. So you should have an idea of, the, um, uh, of how Pasteur uh, conducted his experiment that uh, finally proved that or, or supported uh, biogenesis and uh, this proved this spontaneous generation. But also, uh, there are other things that Pasteur did. 
uh, more in, well, as important as the experiment is what the experiment taught us about microorganisms. Uh, first of all, it, it, it taught us that they're everywhere. Uh, they're in the air. Okay? Even though we cannot see them, they're absolutely everywhere. Uh, and that's how the broth was being contaminated was by air that was carrying the microorganisms into the flask. Um, Pasteur, was, yeah, Pasteur was able, do you, have a, do you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, if you have a question, just go ahead and ask it. Uh, just, uh, you can interrupt at any time. Okay, all right. So, um, so that's one of the importances of Pasteur's experiment. Um, the other one is that uh, we're able to determine the presence of microorganisms because the, uh, the infusion, the, the, the fluid in which the organism is growing becomes cloudy. And that's how we in the lab are going to know whether there, is, there are microorganisms growing in, in a medium is because the medium will become cloudy. The more microorganisms, the cloudier the, the, the medium becomes. Now, that doesn't mean that if the medium is not cloudy that there are no microorganisms there it just means that there are not enough to make the the uh, fluid cloudy um, another uh, importance uh, was that the growth of microorganisms can be controlled with heat meaning that we can kill them with heat um, and that's important because if you want to study something you need to be able to control it so one scientist began to figure out how to control the growth how to stop it how to get started again uh, then you're able to then study the, uh, the, the microorganisms. So um, because microorganisms are everywhere, um, scientists had to develop aseptic techniques, and you should definitely know what aseptic techniques are. Uh, these are techniques used by microbiologists to be able to prevent contamination of, uh, of whatever medium they're using for the microorganisms. So it allows uh, microbiologists to isolate microorganisms meaning uh, microorganisms are always growing in their natural environment. They're growing uh, with many different types uh, growing together. So there's never just one little single type of microorganism in an environment. There's always many, many different types growing together. So if you want to study them, you need to be able to separate the ones you want to study from the population, from the rest of the population. And we call that isolation. So we need to use aseptic techniques to isolate. We're going to do these in a uh, uh, lab next time every time we work with microorganisms we use aseptic techniques because we don't want to uh, introduce unwanted microorganisms into our, our experiments or our cultures so isolation uh, uh, we need aseptic tech we follow aseptic techniques when we isolate organisms to culture microorganisms means to grow them um, and then to identify them and study them, again, we need to use aseptic techniques. So we're going to, especially in lab, be using constantly the terms isolation, culture, uh, incubation, which means to let them grow with heat uh, with the, the, at the appropriate temperature, etc. So uh, do know what aseptic techniques are. Um, the other concept that's important right here is the one of endospores. So it turns out that um, other scientists tried to replicate Pasteur's experiment, the gooseneck flask experiment, and they were not su uh, successful. Uh, their solution after being heated uh, was getting contaminated, and they couldn't figure out why, uh, what was happening. Uh, Tyndall uh, finally figured it out, and what he reasoned was that there were many different types of microorganisms, and some of them are going to be heat sensitive. Now, keep in mind, he didn't quite completely understood what he was talking about. So the way he explained it was that there were some cells that were heat sensitive. And that is, to some extent, correct and not. This is what happens. What happens is that there are some bacteria that are able to produce, to change into a heat resistant form. So some bacteria can uh, when they are stressed, and stress means when they, there is a lack of water, a lack of nutrients, when there is radiation, when there's too high heat, uh, when there's a stress that could kill the cell, the cell transforms itself into a resistant, dormant, 
structure, which we call an endospore. So an endospore is a dormant cell, but it's more than a dormant cell. It's a dormant cell that is resistant to uh, environmental stress, stress. So that this dormant cell can just remain, uh, survive the stress, and as soon as the stress is removed, it becomes a living cell again. So a living cell is a vegetative cell. The dormant cell is the endospore. So endospores are going to be resistant to heat. And that's what was surviving the boiling, was the endospores. Uh, the minute that the heat uh, dwindled and the endospores began to activate again and become vegetated cells, the solution became cloudy. So um, when we speak in, in microbiology, when we speak of a sterile solution, we're talking about something or, or, or a sterile environment. Anything that we that we give the term is ster is sterile. That means that um, there are no forms of microbial life present, including endospores. So we are able to destroy endospores, but that requires special steps. And when we do that, when we when we destroy endospores and everything else, any other form of microbial life, we call that a sterile. Okay, so that's what in microbiology it means to be you know, a sterile solution, a sterile environment, uh, a sterile object. Uh, we are going to um, see endospores under the microscope next week. Uh, we can stain them. And in the, what you can see here in this picture is these little green things are the endospores and the red are the, the, the vegetative cells. Professor so Sarah? Yeah, go ahead. Um, for the first, on the theory of spontaneous generations experiments of Tyndall, the first heat sensitive cells or vegetal, vegetative cells was, what was that called? Because the uh, second the, was dormant, dormant or resistant. What was the first one? Uh, a vegetative cell. The vegetative oh. cell is the light cell, the quote unquote normal cell. The heat resistant form is the endospore. The endospore. Now, keep in mind, this is true of only some bacteria. So some bacteria happen to have the ability to turn into a dormant cell that we call an endospore. So not, okay. not all bacteria can do this. Um, Pasteur was lucky, or he was a very clean person, because in his lab, he didn't have any endospore forming bacteria, and he was not working with any endospore forming bacteria. Had he, had he done that, his experiment would not have worked. So typically, endospore forming bacteria are found in dirt. Um, the other scientists that were trying to, to replicate Pasteur's experiment were obviously not as careful, not as clean. They were using different types of material that had dirt in there. When you have dirt, you have endospores. So you have, you have endospore forming bacteria. Okay. And that was the problem right there. So some bacteria have the ability to, when they're, when they're experiencing environmental stress that would normally kill any other bacteria, instead, these, these cells transform themselves into a dormant uh, form, which, are, which we call an endospore. So it is an important concept. Um, because we're going to talk about endospores a lot throughout the semester. So this is the first introduction about what are endospores and why are they important. Um, well, they're important because they can survive st environmental stress. They can survive heat, radiation, uh, lack of food, lack of water, etc. Things that normally will kill a normal cell. So a, a live normal cell is called a vegetative cell. The dormant form, we call it an endospore. So dormant, I mean, the endospore is resistant and is dormant. Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I just want to address this question for a little bit. If you know that solution B is a sterile solution, the minute you know it's a sterile solution, you know there's nothing in that, in that fluid, including endospores. Could you conclusively state that solution B has no microbial growth, including endospores? Then the answer is yes, you can. If you call something a sterile, there's nothing there, including endospores. Okay, so not even, because um, I remember you said, although, is that the same thing as it becoming cloudy and not having um, enough 
um, microorganisms inside of it. Right. So you can you see how fluid A is cloudy. So you can say there's definitely microorganisms in there. Now they could be dead microorganisms, but whatever it is, it's definitely something in there. Um, B, unless we tell you this is a sterile, there could be microorganisms there, but it may be so few that they don't turn the solution cloudy. The minute we specify this is a sterile, then you know that whatever, if there's something in there, whatever's in there is dead. So okay. there is essentially nothing alive in, in solution B. Uh, any other questions? No, ma'am. Okay. So, um, other terms that you need to know, uh, biodegradation, biotechnology, genetic engineering. Okay, biodegradation uh, refers to the, um, the, pro the, to the, the uh, process that utilizes microorganisms to clean up environmental problems. And so, students definitely need to know the definition of these terms, and you should be able to come up with maybe examples of uh, biodegradation. A uh, perfect example is the bacteria that that uh, eats up oil, oil spills. So when there's an oil spill in a body of water, uh, bacteria are used to clean up the, uh, the, uh, the oil. So that's one use of microorganisms to clean up an environmental problem. Um, and the, uh, the book will have other examples for you. Uh, there's also uh, uh, waste treatment plants use microbes to clean up the solid matter in, in, in used water, in, in, uh, in water that has already gone through, in, in sewage water, etc. Uh, now, biotechnology and genetic engineering. Uh, biotechnology is the use of, micro uh, of microbes and biochemical techniques okay, to solve human problems. So this is the use of microorganisms and the manipulation of microorganisms to, for, for human purposes. Um, one of the tools that biotechnology uses is genetic engineering. Uh, so genetic engineering will be a tool of biotechnology. What genetic engineering uh, takes uh, the genetic material of microorganisms and modifies it either introduces a, a different gene or modifies a gene that's already there, et cetera. Okay. So biotechnology, is, you should know uh, uh, the definition of biotechnology. You should know that genetic engineering is one of the techniques that biotechnology uses. Uh, examples of biotechnology, um, we are now are making uh, insulin. Uh, we now have yeast cells that are making human insulin for us. And we took taken the uh, gene for insulin, put it into a little microbe cell, and the cell begins to make human insulin for us. Uh, we're doing the same thing with human growth hormone. It's now a microorganism that has received the human gene for human growth hormone that is producing the hormone for us. So we don't need to harvest it from animals anymore. Uh, we're using mi microorganisms to make vaccines for us nowadays. Okay, so that's what we call genetic engineering or, or biotechnology. So you should be able to explain what it is and come up with examples. Okay, um, let's see really quick. Uh, the other concept to, yeah, um, this one right here. Uh, you should know what is an emerging disease and what is a re-emerging disease. So an emerging disease is a, um, uh, a new disease that is challenging humans. And new diseases come about because of changing in lifestyle of, of uh, humans, because of genetic changes in microorganisms that come up with new forms of the microorganism. So there are two reasons why we get new kinds of uh, uh, diseases, of microorganisms. Uh, on the other hand, re-emerging diseases those are uh, diseases that we thought we conquered, and now they're coming back. Uh, and you should know the reasons why uh, this happens. Uh, a lax attitude or suspicious attitude towards vaccination. Uh, well, this is to a population that really do, do, not, do not understand what infections are like, because we pretty much have grown up without experiencing uh, how bad an, an infection can be or an epidemic can be. 
Um, this is incredibly important, the development of drug-resistant microorganisms right there. The misuse of antibiotics, which are giving rise to organisms that cannot be killed with anything. So that's another reason for re-emerging diseases. Uh, an aging population, immunocompromised population, uh, patients with uh, uh, transplant patients, cancer patients, AIDS patients, which we didn't have before and now do. So that's another reason why we have these uh, re-emerging infections. Uh, world travel, you know, taking microorganisms all over the world, uh, that's another another reason. So do tell, do be able to explain the difference between uh, emerging and re-emerging diseases and the causes for each. Um, let's see. Another concept that's important because we'll come back over and over again, uh, normal microbiota or normal flora, these are the organisms that are in our body and uh, they're beneficial. They just uh, have colonized our bodies and they live in the surface of our bodies. So our skin, uh, any, any opening in our body that's open to the outside will be colonized with microorganisms and they are our permanent residents. Uh, they are um, uh, we call them normal, normal microbiota or normal flora. Uh, this is the list of uh, the reasons why they're good for us. They prevent disease because they, they uh, true pathogens must compete with them in order to colonize our bodies. Uh, they're constantly challenging our immune system. They help us digest food. This right here is very, very important too. Normal flora, even though they're very, very good, it is also true that all of them are opportunistic pathogens meaning that if you give them a chance, if they overgrow or they go to a place where they shouldn't be, uh, they could cause disease. So every one of our normal flora could make us sick in the, if they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay, so E. coli, for example, in the colon, that's where it's supposed to be, it's fine, healthy to have it there. If for uh, whatever reason it moves to the urinary bladder, it could cause a urinary, uh, a urinary tract infection. For example, so oh, okay. Professor Seta. Yeah. So is that also the reason why, like, if, um, for instance, you travel outside of the United States, they want you to get all of these vaccinations, so that once you travel somewhere else, you won't bring anything back. Yes, and that would be a reason. Uh, it, it doesn't have to do much with normal flora, as it has to do with trying to prevent the reemergence of, the, of uh, diseases, for example, uh, yes. Okay. So it has to do with, with controlling either new infections uh, or preventing reemergence of, of, of infections. So for example, uh, typhoid fever. Uh, there's really not typhoid fever in the United States. It is, however, endemic in other parts of the world. If you're going to travel to those areas, they're going to want you to take a vaccine against typhoid fever so that you don't bring it back. So we don't want a reemergence of typhoid fever in the United States because we have already conquered that, that disease. Okay. Um, so opportunistic pathogens again, uh, normal flora are examples of opportunistic pathogens. Or normal flora, every one of them can be an opportunistic pathogen if we give them the chance. Uh, it is important to know the difference between opportunistic pathogens and true pathogens. So two things. First of all, an opportunistic pathogen is common. It's common in the environment. It's common in our bodies. It's not a rare organism. Uh, that's one. Two, uh, they will cause disease in weak hosts. Uh, a weak host will be someone who's very old, very young, or immunocompromised. On the other hand, pathogenic organisms are rare, um, and they can cause disease in any host. So the fact that one is common and the other one is rare is an important distinction between opportunistic pathogens and true pathogenic organisms. So E. coli is everywhere, uh, and it could cause disease if we allow it to. So it is an opportunistic pathogen. Um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, on the other hand, is a very rare organism, and uh, it could it is a, a, a pathogenic organism that could cause could cause disease in uh, nearly every host. Okay, so do know the difference between opportunistic and, and pathogenic organisms, and a lot of these terms are going to come back over and over again throughout the semester. This is one of them. So if a question asks whether normal flora are opportunistic pathogens, the answer is definitely. They can be. They are, really yet. Okay. 
As a matter of fact, most infections are caused by opportunistic pathogens, not by true pathogenic organisms, because true pathogenic organisms are rare. Okay, so that takes care of the first set of PowerPoints. Um, any questions? Oh, ma'am, that, that's perfect. Because I had kind of um, highlighted over through the notes already, but you, the what you focused on kind of helped me as well to be prepared for the exam. Perfect, perfect. Um, so I can move on to number two. And that uh, this is, again, this is the most important aspect of, of this chapter is uh, number two. Um, we, are we not going to go over um, chapter oh, one, one, part B? Yeah. I, I, yeah, when I said number two, I meant the second part of chapter one. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's what I was referring to. Okay, so what this does is it gives you a survey of microorganisms. And first thing we need to know is um, da, 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 the domains right here. Okay, so you definitely need to know the three domains uh, the domain bacteria, the domain archaea, the domain eukarya. You should know that these two domains, bacteria and archaea, uh, have prokaryotic cells whereas the domain eukarya is made of uh, eukaryotic cells, okay? Uh, prokary prokaryotic is not a domain. Prokaryotic is, describes a type of cell. And that's important to know. Prokaryotic, okay. All right, prokaryotic cells. All right. Next order of business is to know the difference between a eukaryotic and a prokaryotic cell. So a eukaryotic cell, and this is a good depiction of a eukaryotic cell, is a cell that is typically larger than a prokaryotic cell. Uh, this is the key right here. It has a nucleus. Okay, so the presence of a nucleus alone by definition, that's what makes a eukaryotic cell. The way eukaryotic, what karyo means is nucleus, and eu means new. So this is a new, a, a cell that has a nucleus. That's the key. Uh, it also has uh, organelles and um, it's to be more specific it has what we call membrane bound organelles meaning it has organelles that are made of membranes so uh, mitochondria Golgi apparatus uh, endoplasmic reticulum um, all of these are membrane bound organelles so a eukaryotic cell is going to have a nucleus and it's going to have membrane bound organelles that would be what's going to uh, differentiate a eukaryotic cell from a prokaryotic cell a prokaryotic cell, on the other hand, is a little bit smaller than a eukaryotic, generally, uh, that has uh, a uh, boundary, you no know, little cell membrane, no nucleus, so it has no nucleus, no organelles, which means that it has no compartment. It is essentially a one-room entity. Uh, everything is in the same in the same place. Uh, DNA, uh, all of the enzymes, all of the uh, chemicals that are needed to make ATP to uh, to, to uh, anabolize and catabolize. Everything happens in just one place. Um, the uh, DNA of the cell is going to be in the cytoplasm, uh, and it's typically in a little place in the cytoplasm that we're going to call the nucleoid. We'll see that in a little bit. Um, Prokaryotic cells will have ribosomes, so that would be the only uh, organelle that they're going to have, but this is not a membrane-bound organelle. Um, so um, remember that bacteria, the domain bacteria and the domain archaea, both have prokaryotic cells. Uh, bacteria are going to be single-cell organisms, uh, and so will be archaea. Okay, archaea, again, the domain archaea, single cell organisms, uh, you cannot distinguish them from bacteria. If you look at them under the microscope, they look exactly the same. So the differences between archaea and bacteria are going to be chemical differences. Uh, other than that, they, they are very much the same. All right, so what we do next is go over the, um, uh, the uh, uh, eukaryotic uh, microorganisms. Okay, so again, the eukaryotic cell, Remember that it has a membrane-bound nucleus. It has membrane-bound organelles, whereas the prokaryotic is generally smaller, uh, has no nucleus, has no organelles. So 
a eukaryotic cell will have a cell membrane, which is also called a plasma membrane. Uh, all cells will have a cell membrane or a plasma membrane, whether they are eukaryotic or prokaryotic. Um, eukaryotic cells are going to have cytoplasm. All cells have cytoplasm. Um, Membrane-bound nucleus that contains the DNA. Membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, etc. Uh, let's see what else. Yeah, that's just showing you all the little or oh, ribosomes. Uh, yeah, ribosomes right here, which are organelles that do not have membranes. Um, in contrast, the little cell will have a cell membrane. And okay, so you definitely need to know the features that are common to all cells. So all cells are going to have cell membrane. All cells are going to have cytoplasm. All cells are going to have DNA. So cell membrane, cytoplasm, DNA, and ribosomes are the four things that all cells are going to have. Cell membrane, ribosomes, cytoplasm, DNA. You can definitely know that, what's common to every single cell. Um, prokaryotes are not going to have membrane-bound organelles. So again, they have no compartments. Everything happens in one place. The DNA will be found in the cytoplasm. A uh, little ribosome will be found in the cytoplasm. And so this picture shows you the size difference between uh, eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. And we're going to do this in lab next time on Thursday. Uh, this huge pink blob here is a eukaryotic cell. It's a, a human cheek cell. There's the little nucleus of the cell right there. And these little purple dots you see everywhere are, are the bacteria. So you can see the difference in size between bacteria of the prokaryotic cell and the eukaryotic cell. Okay. All right, questions? Okay, so we're going to go for the, the bacteria first. Okay, the characteristics of bacteria. All bacteria are prokaryotic cells. We got that one already. All of them are single cell organisms. Um, because there isn't much to identify them, one of the things we rely on to identify bacteria are their different shapes. So we're always going to note the shape of a bacteria. Uh, is it a circular bacteria? Is it an elongated bacteria? Is it a, you know, a spiral, a little, little wavy rod? So shapes are going to be important. Um, most have cell walls. Now, notice that it says most, not all. So there will be a few that don't have a cell wall, but most are going to have a cell wall. And in most cases, the cell wall is going to be made of a substance called peptidoglycan. And we're going to talk a lot about peptidoglycan the entire semester. So get used to peptidoglycan. Uh, peptidoglycan is unique to bacteria. No other cell in our planet has peptidoglycan except for bacteria. Okay. Uh, they're going to divide by a binary fission, which is a form of asexual reproduction. Um, they're going to lack a nuclei uh, so that the DNA is going to be in the cytoplasm in a, in a specific region that we're going to call the nucleoid. So the nucleoid is the place in the cytoplasm where the uh, DNA of the prokaryotic cells are found. Uh, they're going to move, and when they move, they typically move by means of something called a flagella. Uh, they lack membrane-bound organelles. Okay, so there's a little bacteria. It is a unicellular uh, organ entity. It has a cell membrane. Everything has a cell membrane. It has a DNA in the nucleoid. Uh, it has ribosomes. Most are going to have a, a cell wall, and the cell wall will be made of peptidoglycan. Uh, here gives you different shapes of bacteria. You have the rod shape, the cocci or circular shape, little bit rods uh, that almost look cocci because they're so little. Then you have the little spirals. And tomorrow in lab, we're going to see different kinds of bacteria, different shapes. Uh, there's the uh, flagella right there. And this is bacteria dividing by binary fission. Uh, oops, give me just a second. I just skipped over a PowerPoint. Uh, OK, we've already covered all these. Yeah, we did. OK, so definitely know all the characteristics of bacteria. And there is a, a uh, chart in uh, on uh, this, uh, under the module one material that summarizes all the characteristics of all the microorganisms. And it asks for whether the organism has a nucleus, whether it has 
um, membrane-bound organelles, whether it's single cell or multicellular, what type of reproduction, sexual or asexual, if it has a cell wall, and note that it, you know, in the case of bacteria, you would note yes, and it's a peptidoglycan cell wall. So you can summarize all these in that chart. And there is a, a completed version of the chart on eCampus also. So moving on, the archaea. Archaea are identical to bacteria except, uh, except that they do have a cell wall, but the cell wall is not made of peptidoglycan. Okay, peptidoglycan is unique to, back to the domain of bacteria. Um, some inhabit extreme environments, that's one of the characteristics of the archaea. So other than the fact that they have no peptidoglycan and uh, they do have an, uh, other uh, chemical differences, uh, they are identical to bacteria. So you look at them under the microscope, you would know whether it's a bacteria or an archaea. Um, moving on, let's go for the prokaryotes, and we can start with the algae. So this is the material what we kind of we cover already in lab. So this is a little bit of review. Uh, when it comes to algae, uh, remember from the lab that we had two types of algae. We had unicellular and multicellular algae. Uh, we saw Sparogyra as multicellular, and we saw um, Euglena as unicellular. If I don't go back, I don't know what happened there. Okay. Um, there are eukaryotes, because they are eukaryotes, they're going to have a nucleus and organelles. They belong to the kingdom proteist. They are photosynthetic. This is what distinguishes them from um, other uh, eukaryotic microorganisms, is that these guys are photosynthetic. They do have a cell wall and the reproduction will be sexual or asexual. They're very similar to plants, algae. Okay, so the, the next PowerPoint, just go over these again. Uh, so there's your unicellular algae here, and this is the multicellular algae, more multicellular algae right there. And again, here's more algae. These are the diatoms that some of you saw under the microscope last time on a Tuesday. And this is just showing you asexual reproduction and then sexual reproduction. So you don't need to know the details of the reproduction. Just know that they can reproduce sexually and asexually. Uh, the next group, uh, let's see, we got that already. Yeah, the next group of proteins are going to be the protozoans. Um, so the protozoans and the algae are in the same kingdom. They're very much related. And we in, in microbiology, especially in medical microbiology, we still kind of try to distinguish them. Um, a real microbiologist you know, or a real uh, biologist will not uh, because they're very much, they're, they, they're found in the same kingdom. And there are some, some protozoa that are photosynthetic. So you know, they're kind of, the, the, the lines between algae and protozoa are a little bit blur. But in medical microbiology, we keep calling them protozoas, and we, we definitely try to pull them apart from the algae. So uh, what we call protozoans are going to be non-photosynthetic cells. They're going to be unicellular, uh, which algae can be both, uh, unicellular or um, multicellular. These are the only ones that lack cell wall. Okay, So actually, don't, get, don't let cell wall confuse you, because ultimately, Everybody has a cell wall, as far as microorganisms are concerned, except for the protozoans. They're the only ones that don't have a cell wall. Bacteria, archaea, the fungi, the, the algae, all of them have cell walls, except for uh, the protozoans. And that's why they're called animal-like, because animals don't have cell walls either. Uh, most of them are reproduced asexually. We classify them by motility. You know, they have cilia, flagella, pseudopods. Uh, it says no motility. That's true. Some of them are non-motile. However, the ones that are non-motile are motile at some point in their lives. So um, let's see. So these are, we saw them, uh, we saw, uh, let's see, no, protozoan classified. Um, yeah, that's a little, a little uh, uh, protozoan. Uh, this one has cilia as motility. Again, you can have the paramecium that has cilia. This one has flagella. This one has pseudopods. That's an amoeba. Okay, so that is the protozoans. Uh, again, interrupt me if you have questions, otherwise I'll keep moving. Uh, the last of the kingdoms is the fungi, the kingdom fungi. And we have two types, uh, the uh, mold and the uh, yeast. Now, first thing about fungi, somehow 
students always want to put fungi as photosynthetic organisms, maybe because sometimes they have like greenish colors to them, but that's deceiving. No, fungi are not photosynthetic. Okay, that's important to remember. Um, we have two types. We have the multicellular fungi, which we call mold, and the unicellular fungi, which we call uh, yeast. Um, yeah, we're going to, let's see here. Yeah, molds uh, have hypha that we call them filamentous fungi. They have the little strings called hypha. They have cell walls, and they can reproduce sexually or asexually. And then the next PowerPoint showed you a little bit about what hypha is, and the hypha is made of cells, and that's why this is a multicellular organism. There's the little hypha here and the fluidine bodies at the end, which have the spores. Don't confuse spores with endospores. The spores are for reproductive purposes. So the little endospore falls in the ground and creates, like by there, creates a hypha. Endospores are in bacteria. And they're not for reproductive purposes, they're for survival purposes. Okay, so they're very different entities. Uh, don't confuse them. Again, that's showing you uh, uh, mold uh, reproducing sexually. On the other hand, yeast are unicellular. Uh, most will exhibit asexual reproduction, and the reproduction is by means of a technique called budding. So you can see a little budding yeast right there, a little bud. Uh, they do have a cell wall. And again, that's just a little yeast. Um, again, that's yeast with a cell wall, cell membrane, a nucleus that surrounds an organelle, and there's another yeast. And this is just to compare and contrast a yeast and mold. One is multicellular, the other one is unicellular. Uh, one has a hypha, the other one doesn't have hypha. Both of them have a cell wall made of chitin. Uh, yeast go through budding, uh, mold does not, it goes through sexual, other forms of reproduction, uh, does have sexual and asexual reproduction. Okay. Um, when you look at the chart on eCampus for chapter one, uh, again, I cannot emphasize enough, expect something like that for the test. Expect some form of chart that you will need to fill in or uh, complete or something partially filled or something like that. Okay. So do become familiar with the characteristics of these organisms as, as uh, presented in the chart. Um, the last group of microorganisms really do not belong in microbiology, but we do study them in medical microbiology. These are actually animals. Uh, they are not microorganisms. However, medical microbiology does study the, the parasitic worms, okay, the human parasitic worms. So these are going to be animals. They're multicellular, all animals are multicellular. They reproduce sexually, all animals reproduce sexually. And there are two forms of parasitic worms, the flat worms and the round worms. So they're not technically microbes, but we do study them under microbiology and their medical microbiology, okay? Uh, they don't have cell walls because they're animals. And again, they reproduce sexually. And there's the little worm, uh, which is actually a blood parasite in this case. And there's another one, flatworms are also called platyhelmids, and raw worms are called nematodes. Okay. So you should know what we mean by unicellular versus multicellular, which, which types of microorganisms are unicellular, which types are multicellular, uh, which types of microorganisms use binary fission for reproduction, that will be the bacteria and the archaea, which types of microorganisms use budding as their form of reproduction, and that would be the, um, the yeast. OK, so uh, last part of this chapter looks at how we name organisms. And at the lowest level of classification, at the most precise level of classification, we name uh, organisms by their genus and species. So the, the biggest level of classification would be the um, domain. From there, we go into, um, into a, a kingdoms. Uh, then we can go into phylums, uh, groups, families, etc. So right before a genus, we have a family. So the highest level, uh, higher than a, than a genus is a family. So from fam families are divided into, gen into genera. Uh, genera are divided into species. So those are the levels of classification. By the time we get to the individual bacteria, the lowest level, we classify them by the genus and the species. 
uh, the way we name, we uh, write down these names, the genus name is always capitalized, the species name is not capitalized. And then the entire name is going to be underlined or italicized. So for example, uh, Staphylococcus aureus is the genus and species of a bacteria. Uh, the genus name is capitalized, the species name is not. Uh, Escherichia coli, again, Escherichia will be the genus, coli will be the species. Escherichia is capitalized, coli is not. So you should be able to uh, recognize, given the name of a bacteria, recognize which is the genus, which is the species. Now, when it comes to genus, um, a genus is the bigger box. Um, the genus includes many different species. So there are general characteristics that belong to a genus. So for example, in the Staphylococcus genus, all of the organisms are going to be round cocci. Uh, when we gram stain them, and we're going to do a gram stain starting Thursday, which is the most important stain of microbiology, when they are gram stained, they're going to gram stain purple. They grow in clusters, and they can grow with or without oxygen. So those are the characteristics of all the Staphylococcus, no exceptions. Um, then if you go for the species, well, there are different species. We have a Staphylococcus aureus, we have a Staphylococcus epidermides. Now, both of them are going to be cocci growing in uh, clusters. Uh, they're going to stain purple in the gram stain. So they have, all of them have the Staphylococcal characteristics. Now, if you look at this next PowerPoint, you can see that Staph aureus, when it's grown on a medium, gives you a yellowish colony whereas epidermis yeast is giving you a whitish colony. So there's a difference between the species right there. And then it tells you that Staphylococcus ferments a sugar called mannitol, whereas Staph epidermis does not. Um, Staph aureus has an enzyme called coagulase, and Staph epidermis does not. So there are chemical differences between the species also. Okay, the next concept is also important. It's going to be in the test for sure is the concept of um, strains. And let me go back here. And this is why it's important, is because if bacteria divide by binary fission, you have one little bacteria, and that little bacteria divide, and it creates two identical daughter cells, and they divide, and each creates another identical daughter cell, and this goes on and on and on. So in theory, because bacteria clone themselves, there should be no difference between the between the species, between uh, cells of the same genus and the species, there should be absolutely no difference. All the staph aureus cells will be, should be identical to each other. Turns out they're not, that uh, there are mechanisms by which bacteria can acquire differences in their, in their genetic material. We'll study those, those uh, mechanisms in chapter 8. But the fact that, that you can have a Staphylococcus aureus uh, in one plate being different, a Staphylococcus aureus in another plate, that tells us that, there are, that these acquire uh, genes or can modify their, their genes to become different, a little bit different from each other. So that's what we call a strain. A strain is a variation within a species. So 99% of the genes will be the same except a few. And that those few differences is what makes the strain. Let me give you examples of a strain. Uh, typically, the examples of a strain that we have are medically important. Because when we have a strain, when we find a strain that's medically important, we give it a name. For example, E. coli. That would be your general E. coli. OK. They, they have, um, uh, opportunistic pathogen, normal flora E. coli. Uh, in the 90s, uh, we isolated an E. coli that was extremely uh, pathogenic. The name that it was given was O157H7. It's a deadly E. coli. It is a pathogen. So E. coli O157H7 is not an opportunistic pathogen. It is considered a pathogenic organism because it's so bad. Uh, so Escherichia is the genus. Coli is the species, O157H7 is the strain. Uh, let me give you another example. Another example, I'm going to write it up here. Uh, Haemophilus influenza is a bacteria. Haemophilus is the name of the genus. Um, influenza is the species, and no, it does not cause influenza. 
it is a misnomer. Uh, we thought it did. Turns out it doesn't. But the name is stuck. So Haemophilus influenza, uh, Haemophilus is the genus, influenza is the uh, species. Um, it is normal flora. Uh, all of us carry Haemophilus influenza in our throats. There is a strain of Haemophilus influenza, which we call type B. And Haemophilus influenza type B is pathogenic. It can uh, cause meningitis. So, B is the strain. Um, so notice that there are no rules for a strain name. A strain name can be anything. Whoever uh, identifies the strain gets to name it. So the strain name okay. can be carried. So given okay. The, yeah, go ahead. Um, so when we were talking about the E. coli 0157, so just to make sure I'm saying it right, the E. coli would be the genius in the 0157. H7 would be the strain? Correct. So, okay. The, B is the uh, genus, cola is the species, uh, O157H7 is the strain. Is the strain, perfect. Just trying to make sure that I get an understanding of that because the strain would be what is actually put out there and how deadly the pathogen is or how, how strong it is and how or how weak it is to Correct. a person. Correct. Yes, typically how strong it is. I mean, what, what, what I'm gonna care about one that's weak. So it's typically how strong it is. And, and it's, it, will, it will be, typically, uh, will be the third name. The first word will be the, the, the genus. The second word will be the uh, species. The third word, if, if, if it appears, will be the strain. OK, perfect. OK. So you should be able to identify, you know, to, uh, to know that, to, to explain what a strain is. Okay, so it's a, it's a variation within a species, essentially, uh, which shouldn't happen, but it does because bacteria clone themselves. So there's, in theory, there should be no strains. So the fact that there are strains let us know that bacteria are a lot more versatile than we thought they were. Okay. Um, yeah, before I go into viruses, let me just mention something that I completely forgot, and it should be in the first set of PowerPoints, and I must have completely gone through it and did not, uh, I must have missed it. Um, and I want to mention it because this is something that it's incredibly simple, but the students get confused by it. Um, there's another theory that you should know about. It's called the theory, uh, the germ theory of disease. So germ theory of disease. Oh, that was in the first in the first chapter. Yes, it was. It was, and I meant to talk about it, and then I forgot. So I, I just remember again. So I want to go ahead and address it before I forget it. Um, you should know what the germ theory of disease is, which is the simplest thing in the world, and it seems silly to us, but it wasn't back then. The germ theory of disease simply states that some organisms, some microorganisms, can cause disease. That's it. That's all it is. Okay. But keep in mind, these had to be proven. We had to prove that germs could cause disease. And that was done at the end of the 19th uh, century, beginning of the 20th century. Microbiologists had to prove that because it was a theory. It was, it was not for sure that they could cause disease. And that's why the germ theory of disease uh, was brought forth, which states that germs or microorganisms could cause disease. And it's been proven that that's true, that, that some microorganisms can cause disease. Okay. So it's so simple that it confuses the student. Because they say, surely it can't be that easy. Well, yes, it is. Okay. All right. So um, last thing are the viruses. And first thing about viruses is that they are non-living. So they're not living organisms. So this is the microbial world. And in the microbial world, we have all of the living cells, the living organisms right there. And then to one side, we have these infectious agents which are not alive. They are not cells. They are molecules that happens to uh, parasitize or become parasitic to human cells and force the human cell to make more of these infectious agents. But they are not alive. They are not considered alive. They are not cells. Okay. We call them infectious agents. There's three types of infectious agents. Let me go ahead and go here. We have the viruses, which you probably, oops, you probably heard about viruses. Uh, we have the viroids, and we have the prions. Okay. So 
viruses, viroids, and prions, you should know that. Uh, viruses are the largest. They are, they are all obligate intracellular agents, all of them are. Viruses uh, consist of a nucleic acid, which can be DNA or RNA. So these are nucleic acid molecules. Uh, living cells have both DNA and RNA. Uh, viruses only have one or the other. Um, and then they have a protein. So that's all they are. They are nucleic acids, either DNA or RNA, and a protein. On the other hand, viroids uh, have only RNA. They have no proteins. And you're going to read in the uh, book and in the PowerPoints that viroids infect plants. And that will probably change in the next couple of editions of the book, because that may not be necessarily true. But as of today, we can say uh, viroids inflate plants, even though we suspect that may not be exactly the case. But for now, let's just say viroids infect plants. Prions are only proteins. Uh, they're either, uh, they have no DNA or RNA, and they infect animals. So uh, viruses infect everything. They can infect plants, animals, bacteria, um, and they're made of DNA and of nucleic acids, either DNA or RNA, and a protein coat. Uh, viroids have no protein, only RNA, and prions have no nucleic acids, DNA or RNA, they only have a protein. So definitely know the difference between viruses, virioids, and prions. And that just shows you a little bit further, uh, viruses are very small, they're smaller than most cells. Um, obligate parasites. And there's a little uh, depiction of a virus. This is a this is a bacterial cell right here. The big green blob is a bacterial cell, and the little blue things are viruses infecting the bacterial cell. Uh, this is a viroid, which is just a piece of, of RNA, and these are uh, prions, which are just proteins. Okay. So, any questions? No, male. Okay. Uh, this is what I want to do. What I want to do is uh, just go through the very first part of chapter two, and then I'm going to have to go ahead and uh, close the session. And then we'll, I'll schedule another one uh, for uh, Friday. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I may schedule one for Friday morning for uh, chapter two. Okay. Um, if I can do it tomorrow morning, uh, maybe we'll do it tomorrow morning too, actually. Yeah, we'll do it tomorrow morning. And again, Thursday. this is yeah, Thursday, that's what I meant, Thursday. So maybe I'll schedule one for tomorrow morning because people, uh, students are going to start taking the tests uh, maybe over the weekend. And so I want to cover chapter two before that. So I'll schedule another session for, for Thursday, for tomorrow in the morning. Okay. Um, again, it's going to be recorded. So if people cannot be there, that's fine because we'll record it. But I do want to go over, uh, in case you start looking through the chapter two on your own, I want to just um, point out that we're going to catch chapter two towards the middle. Um, I'm assuming that the first part that, that the students already know, the first part of chapter two. Uh, students already know about uh, pH, about um, uh, water and uh, the characteristics of water, uh, can think. Oh yeah, about about atoms and and uh, molecules, etc. Okay. Uh, the, the, what are atoms made of, etc. So I'm going to skip the first part and I catch it in the middle when the chapter begins to talk about uh, organic versus inorganic molecules. Actually, yeah, uh, because what I'm going to concentrate on are going to be organic molecules, uh, specifically well the the macromolecules that make up living things. So let me go ahead and. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. That's what the part of chapter two that you're going to be responsible for in the test. Um, and the main thing about these molecules is that they are they're huge. They're called macromolecules. They are made by cells, and they make up cells. So the only thing that can make a protein is a living cell. The minute you find a protein somewhere, you know there's got to be a living cell somewhere. So if tomorrow we find proteins on Mars, then we know there's got to be living cells on Mars somewhere because the only thing that can make a protein is a living cell. And so that's the next 
the next uh, uh, PowerPoint show you is the places in a cell where you find these macromolecules and the places in the cell where these macromolecules are made. So this is just for information and as a review. I assume you already know all those things. So I'm just reviewing that by going through these with, you know, in the PowerPoints. Uh, so really, um, uh, I'll start next time um, by going over dehydration synthesis, which uh, is going to um, make these macromolecules. No, and, uh, what else? and so that's that's where I'll start. So okay. About that fact. Okay. okay. So I'm going to start studying chapter two from the beginning when all that is, should be reviewed. We should already know all the first part of chapter two. We should already know. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, any other questions?